Uh, my name is Michael Atkinson. I'm a faculty member in the Johnson Schramm Graduate School of Public Policy, and that's where you all are today. We're on Treaty 6 and Treaty 4 land, and the homeland of the Métis. Uh, and today we're going to uh, enjoy a conversation with Len Edwards, and if you took a look at, uh, at the poster, you'll know that uh, Mr. Edwards is a former Deputy Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs, and of course former Ambassador to Korea and to, uh, and to Japan. And that is just the beginning of, of his of a very, very extensive career that, uh, that Len has had in the public service. Uh, he's been deputy of not just foreign, uh, foreign affairs, but also agriculture. And so his experience is really quite vast. And, uh, and I think really what's important for us in many ways is that Len is a graduate of the University of Saskatchewan, number one thing. I received an honorary degree uh, just this year. And... Um, has been a friend of the school really ever since it was uh, was created. So uh, he suggested that maybe he could come and have a chat about recent developments. And I, I, I said to him, you know, it would be great because I think a lot of people are really interested in hearing a professional's perspective on the rapid change that we're experiencing, all of us experiencing in uh, in the age of Trump. And and, uh, and so really that's, that's what we're going to do today. Um, so if you can all hear us in Regina, we're going to, we're going to turn it over to Len. He's going to have some remarks to begin with. And then this is going to be a conversation. And we'll start probably with some questions or comments from our colleagues in Regina and bring it back here. And you can all get involved. Uh, so with that, well, I'll turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mike, for the uh, kind introduction. And um, I've been looking forward to, to this, even though it was only set up about a week ago. Uh, coming back to Saskatoon and having a chance to talk to people from this school is, is a real is a real pleasure for me. Um, but when you asked me to come, um, I um, and 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 propose this this uh, uh, theme, um, I jumped to the chance because it's been something I've been thinking a little bit about, uh, perhaps more than a little bit, like everybody else, um, and there are. Um, I'm going to say a few words to sort of set the stage around what I think are sort of the two major international foreign policy challenges of our age, if you like. Um, thanks to Mr. Trump, we have discovered um, another one, uh, one of those, but uh, there was another one which I think has been cooking for some time and is now... Uh, with us. So um, I'm going to just talk a little bit about these, these two things as a way of setting the stage. And then, um, uh, of course, uh, I don't expect our conversation is going to be uh, focused on those two things. But um, I did want to start with that because um, uh, I think it sets sort of a bigger, a big, a bigger setting. Um, so, you know, it's very been very very much top of mind um, uh, this question uh, at this age, and it's a natural one, and that is, do we have our foreign policies right? Um, I think I have the answer to that question, and that's no, we don't. Um, but I don't think we're alone in that either. Um, I don't have the answers. I have what I think are some of the answers. Um, so I'm looking forward to the discussion here because um, I expect that uh, listening to you, I will it will help me uh, form some of my own thinking around this uh, around these issues. Um, let me start by just a reflection back, and and you know I think Canada's external policies um, by and large have been successful over the last 70 years um, in in strengthening our federation. Uh, Developing greater prosperity for, our, for for Canadians, protecting our shores and our interests and security, and forging a, an industrious, diverse, and tolerant. And but I would set aside the exception of our relations with the indigenous peoples of this country, but largely a successfully diverse and tolerant nation. Um, now, when I say that, I realize I'm kind of blowing my own horn here because of those 70 years I worked for 38 in the. What started off as the Department of External Affairs uh, became external affairs and international trade, became foreign affairs and international trade, and is now called Global Affairs Canada. Personally, I prefer the first name, uh, external affairs, because I think it, it is 
um, a good uh, a good short form for what we do these days, and that is we manage everything that help takes place externally to our country. Um, but, uh, you know, I was six years of those 38. I was a deputy minister of, of, of both trade and foreign affairs. So I have a certain ownership of that. And, of course, don't be surprised if I think we did a good job. Um, where are we now? Uh, I don't think we're in a particularly good place. Um, part of the difficulty uh, in defining this bad place that we're in is that we have become very much focused on Donald Trump. That's good because he's reminded us of something important, and I'll come to that. Um, but it also has created a lot of other noise, a lot of other angst and so forth that tends to make it difficult to get at the underlying issues. So without, without any apparent thought, this president uh, you know, has turned U.S. policy seeming on its head. Um, he's expressed skepticism towards the Bretton Woods institutions that were put in place after the Second World War. At, under American leadership to serve American interests and provide the ecosystem for their power. Um, he thinks that the rules-based open trading system as, as uh, married with capitalism is no longer working in American interests. He's criticized and belittled America's uh, closest allies with personal tax on some of the leaders, including our own alleging that they've taken advantage of the U.S. marketplace, taken investment dollars from the American economy, and been free riders on American-provided security, both in a North American and European context and elsewhere. And he has shown a personal satisfaction, which is the curi most curious thing for, for us, at least, and it's the hardest thing to kind of square. Indeed, an admiration for autocrats such as Vladimir Putin, uh, you know, Xi Jinping and the Saudi king and his now designated heir, just to name three. And he's often given them the benefit of the doubt, even when their policies acted against U.S. and Western interests. So setting aside Trump's style, um, his election, however, um, and I'm not coming up with anything new here, is symptomatic of the decline of an American willingness to lead and bear the weight of its traditional role. We saw this merging in Obama's years, by the way. This isn't new. Uh, when, when President Obama refused to um, draw, drew a line in Syria, and then, re and then when the Assad stepped over it and, uh, and uh, used uh, 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 biological weapons, uh, chemical weapons against his own people, um, he didn't act. And it was also uh, a rather timid approach to the Libyan conflict, which suggests that America was even then beginning to become um, less ready to sort of step into every battle. There's a tiredness on, in, among many Americans with the cost in blood and in, uh, and in money of constant military interventions abroad. And of course, since the end of the Cold War, when America declared victory, and we all declared victory, and the MRO wrote the end of history and so forth. What we have seen is that as that sort of stasis provided by the Cold War broke away, we have a much more f f uh, fractious world. Uh, we have seen uh, inter intrastate conflict rise, um, and of course the rise of global terrorism. So, so there's a complex uh, uh, relationship, I think, between this American tiredness um, uh, with uh, always being the international policeman and carrying the weight of that and what is occurring within American society itself, particularly economically, where the gap between the rich and the rest of society has grown. You're all familiar with this. I don't really have to go into it. So when they talk about making America great again, it means making it great at home first. Um, the teardown of the WTO and the multilateral trading system and attacks on Washington's key trading partners are the results of a perception that this system has held back America and has benefited others in America's defense. Well, um, so I, I sort of run through those because um, I said I think Trump's victory is symptomatic of, of this thinking in America it may not always express itself as the majority view. It is certainly not the elitist view, 
but it is there nonetheless. So I don't think that even when Trump leaves office, either in 2020 or later, or is impeached, that we're going to see a return to the status quo ante. I think this is a reflection of a fundamental change in America. An America that is no longer the hegemon that it once was, um, and that is now being challenged by China. So what do Canadians do? Um, the, you know, this whole thing we've gone through over the last uh, year or so around the NAFTA, uh, the personal attacks on Prime Minister Trudeau, uh, silly business coming out of the, uh, out of the G8, uh, G7 meeting in Canada and so forth. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, you've probably read it, a lot of sort of saying, is this relationship broken? Um, can we ever get back to where we were? Well, I ask it rather differently. I said, I would say, uh, I'm not too worried about it being broken, but I am concerned that we in Canada haven't realized what's happened south of the border, and we think somehow we can repair this relationship and take it back to where it was. I don't think we can, and I don't think we should. Um, even though we now have a renegotiated NAFTA, and it's helped uh, save the situation, I suppose. We have paid some price for that. Um, but it is not a bad deal when you consider the sorts of uh, forces that we were dealing with. I think it was well negotiated. There's been some criticism that we gave too much here and there and so forth. But at least we have something we can work with, and it's close to what we had. And it has been modernized in some ways as well. Um, I don't think that that means that we are going back to where we were. Um, we have had ongoing trade disputes with the, with the Americans, even with the NAFTA, softwood lumber being the outstanding example, but we've also had uh, trade action taken against Canadian products and so forth. But I predict that that will now become more frequent and that Americans will demand more of us. So my first conclusion then for this, for this uh, setting is that I think it's time we engage as a country in a fundamental rethink of our place on this continent, how we propose to live harmoniously but more fractiously with our next door neighbor, that still is 10 times by sort of all general reckonings of what we are in population, strength, and economy, and so forth, but is now a much more self centered and self absorbed country. So this is, this is pretty fundamental. Why? Because we have, uh, for the last 30 years, put ourselves wholeheartedly into the hands of our neighbor uh, economically. Our prosperity has, we have tied our prosperity uh, to the American uh, wagon, uh, to the American horse, rather. Um, as George Grant called it when I was going to this university and he wrote Lament for a Nation, which is actually, you should read it. Um, he called the American Empire. Um, and it has been a very good relationship. George Grant wouldn't, wasn't very happy with, what, with where it went, uh, the death of conservatism and uh, the, the rise of the liberal world and so forth, as he called it. Um, but it's been good for us, but it's made us complacent. It's made us dependent um, for our prosperity. And it has, and I saw this when I was working, it has become an excuse for not doing other things. So it's also the same in security terms. Now, maybe the case isn't quite as clear cut, but let me suggest to you that in defending itself, we were, too happy, we were very happy to have them defend Canada at the same time. We even were able to get out of putting nuclear weapons on our soil. They would do all of that dirty work. Um, and, uh, of course, uh, the downside was that if they wanted to take out uh, nuclear weapons, uh, uh, ICBMs from Russia, and now think uh, North Korea, it would probably happen over Canada, which is not a good thing. But uh, nonetheless, we were safe uh, and sound um, under this um, 
uh, under the American security umbrella. And we were safe here, but our interests were safe in Europe. So this rethink about um, over-dependence and complacency in our relationship to the United States um, also means that we need to rethink and re-strategize about our relations with the, net, with the rest of the world. Um, so where do we need to pick up our game? Where should our priorities be in terms of investments, of time, money, and international affairs? Um, I'll give you one of my persistent hobby horses in my time, uh, even when I was working, and that is our relationships with the Indo-Pacific, as it's now being called, remain underdeveloped and behind where they were in the late 1990s, just as we were, as the NAFTA was coming on, when Canada was regarded in the region as a member, an engaged member of the Asia-Pacific Club. We're no longer. And um, I must say that Mr. Harper, when he was Prime Minister and I worked for him as his Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs, took us out of Asia. Um, well, rather, maybe ignored it is a better word. Um, he went for Latin America. Nothing wrong with Latin America and the Caribbean. It was a priority for his government. But now, uh, with Mr. Trudeau, who remembers Latin America and the Caribbean? So, you see, we've become, you know, these have always been uh, ancillary relationships to the one we have with the United States and the, the hemispheric relationship. I am saying that we need to question the very that very basis, uh, basic approach. I'm not suggesting we need a new third option, uh, uh, which uh, uh, Father Trudeau uh, introduced uh, uh, when he was prime minister. And this is, I'm not suggesting we abandon our hemispheric arrangements. It's not an either or thing. We have to just find a new equilibrium somehow that keeps us engaged in the North American sphere, but uh, provides a new personality, a new identity for Canada in our foreign policy. So now let me talk on the second one. I'm going on longer than I intended, but I, I want to put this out here and I'll be quicker with this one. And, and here I'm touching on something that uh, has been well discussed, and I'm sure uh, you'll follow and have followed closely. It's taken a bit of time to get that sort of international discourse going on this, but um, it has, it's now, I think, in full flight. Um, and it has to do with what's happening in the world generally. And that is that global economic power is shifting dramatically away from the Western, traditional Western world, Western states, which were as little as 30 years ago, hugely dominant. It's shifting to authoritarian states, such as China, Russia, and Saudi Arabia. These growing economies led by China will surpass Western states in terms of economic income within the next decade or, or earlier. We should expect that those states will either want to reshape the international order more to their liking, or as we've already seen in the Chinese instance, because we did not reshape the Bretton Woods institutions when they, when they wanted us to back in 2008, 2009, when I was the Sherpa at the G20, when we did not reshape our institutions, they created their own. So you have now uh, the infrastructure bank, and other institutions, the Shanghai Group and so forth, that are in fact Chinese created entities that reflect, as Americans did at the end of the Second World War, reflect their approach to international governance, which are dominated, by, of course, by, uh, by, by Beijing. Inside our own countries, um, this so-called international order, or the liberal international order, democratic order, whatever we call it, has not lost support, has, has lost support. And why? Because the distribution of wealth that was created by the system has not been even across, um, the, across uh, our, our economies. Um, I read recently in Foreign Affairs by a very good article, and I can't remember the name of the authors who prepared them. It was in, I think, maybe the last edition of Foreign Affairs. Um, that in 1970, the top 1% of income earners in the United States controlled 8% of pre-tax income. 30 years later, they now control 20%. And when you look at inflation-adjusted wages in the United States, after a period of growth, 
In the last 30 years, they have remained flat. So, the rich get richer, the middle class don't become poorer, they just don't go anywhere, and the poor have become poorer. So, this has been reflected in a lot of other countries. Um, I think in Canada, there is a concern about this, certainly. In other countries, the pro so this undermined the, the international order. In other countries, especially in Eastern Europe, what we've seen there is the flow of refugees and migrants has created tensions and, and a perceived threat to local identity and social cohesion with not a, 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 and a not insignificant dose of racism is also an undermining factor. So the present preservation of the order is going to be very hard to achieve without rebuilding confidence and support for at, at home in democratic states. So this is where we really get ourselves into a difficult situation. We want to, to maintain the order because it's in our best interest to do so, because it reflects our democratic values and the way we would like to see the world run and managed in a respectful way and so forth, uh, with an underpinning on, on these values. But we're not going to be able to defend it if our own populations are not 100%, not 100%, but more in support of it than they uh, are now. So we have to start at home. That's not foreign policy, that's domestic policy. And maybe in Canada we don't have to worry about it so much because we don't see that undermining take place, but the, the great country that established this system, the United States, it's a serious issue. So, um, and we're already seeing ways in which, um, so we have, to, we have to fix it at home, but we do have to uh, continue to work to somehow maintain this system. So I, I throw this out as sort of the next challenge for Canada, and, that, and here we, we, it's a shared challenge with other Western countries, and that is, what do we do uh, about the democratic or liberal international order? Um, we've already seen the shift, the result of the shift of power, in the ways in which China is using its economic power to leverage uh, political outcomes in Europe. There have been cases where votes in the EU have been affected by the Chinese, uh, particularly in Greece and in the Balkans, have interfered in decision-making in Brussels. Um, there have been a number of outspoken uh, uh, representatives of, uh, of the Commission and European countries uh, who have been uh, alarmed by what uh, Chinese economic leverage can do. Um, and, um, and of course, we've seen what's happening in, in Africa. Um, and now the pushback uh, against China and the Belt and Road Initiative, the indebtedness that's been created in places like, uh, uh, well, we've seen the pushback by Mahathir in Malaysia. Uh, we've seen the failure in Sri Lanka where, they, where China was able to uh, literally uh, confiscate a big port operation when and the Sri Lankans couldn't pay, the, pay back the loans and so forth. Um, as a country where support for the order is still strong and with so much at stake in the preservation of that order, including a, as a means for moderating the behavior of our great neighbor to the south, uh, Canada needs to be a, a, a vocal and energetic leader. So I think we can do so um, as we reposition out from under the U.S.-dominated economic and security umbrella, it could become part two of some new Canadian identity on the global stage. In other words, step up and be a global leader, championing the liberal order and so forth. Now, we've seen some of this already from the Trudeau government. Uh, last year, uh, uh, Foreign Minister Freeland delivered a statement in the House of Commons in which he talked about this and said that Canada would be playing... Uh, role in this. I, I think to be fair uh, to her, uh, we haven't seen much of it. Um, and to be fair to her, uh, she's had her priority has been on the NAFTA negotiations, uh, renegotiations, not on this. So perhaps we'll see a little bit more uh, now that the new uh, USMCA uh, is more or less in place. So given what's at stake, a world of rules and liberal values or a worst-case return to the law of the jungle. And again, uh, you'll see articles written by experts and academics that are now talking about these rather stark uh, opposites 
and possible outcomes in which the words law of the jungle are being used quite deliberately as a world in which a China dominated. I'm using China because China will be um, uh, uh, the, the, the main economic and political force on this globe by the end of this century. Let's not make no mistake about it. Uh, is that the kind of world we want to regress to? Or are we going to stand and fight for a continuation of maybe two systems? Or, let's even be hopeful, and there are some that are hopeful, that as China progresses to greater economic strength and prosperity for its people and so forth, the, uh, the influence of the Communist Party will begin to wane. And as happened in Korea, a country in which I served, uh, the dictators and autocrats will recede and democracy will come into place. I think we should not count on that happening. Um, uh, and uh, which means, again, we should not be complacent. Um, so where could Canada play a role as a rallying uh, nation for states everywhere um, to engage their citizens uh, on what state? Because I don't think it can happen any other way. This can't be just done by the elites. This has to in involve a nation. Refocusing minds on the underlying values we're trying to preserve and modernize and then initiating an action program uh, to update and reform the institutions to today's needs. Because I think it's quite clear that the Bretton Woods institutions have not uh, met the, have not been attractive uh, to many uh, emerging economies, and so they have gone the other way. But there are many, many states in this world, and they're in the, the former developing world, they're now, they're in Africa, and some in Latin America, and so forth, that, frankly speaking, um, are not going to enjoy being the um, uh, 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 the, the victims of Chinese uh, or other large autocratic power uh, leverage. Um, this can give them some hope that this system will look after their interests when uh, they are faced by powerful uh, partners. Um, so I think I've said enough. Um, I've tried to outline, uh, state that there are two major challenges facing Canada. One is specific to it, and that is our hemispheric, revisiting our, our hemispheric uh, uh, vocation. The other is working with the other Western democratic countries in preserving the international uh, liberal order um, uh, for the future. So within those two large realms of uh, strategic issues, there are all kinds of other bits and pieces. You can talk about foreign policy on a much more micro level, and I expect that was to probably want to engage in that, so we certainly can engage, but I wanted to start with this, these two big frame uh, suggestions for uh, Canada's future foreign policy. Thank you. Thanks for getting us going.